Yo, how y'all doing tonight? Today I got some um, some heartbreaking news about one of my Facebook friends, man. Um, she lost her son. Now, I know a lot of people, they... A lot of people, they lose children, but... Just a few years ago, she lost her newborn baby. The son, I think he was a preteen, headed into his early teen years. I haven't gotten all the details on it, but I'm hurting for her. I, I, I don't even know what to say. And obviously, her loss isn't about me, but you know, I make I make it a point to not talk about myself through other people's loss. But I mean, just just to sort of I don't know give some frame of reference as to why. It hit so hard, and it hit a lot of people really, really hard, because she's a really great person. She has a great personality. I think she's loved by pretty much everybody. But, um, you know, my, my own son, Kyle, he's he's seven years old. Now, he was born in just 24 weeks. He, If he was just like a day or two earlier, they wouldn't even try to save him. He was born that early. And not only was he born early, he was born with a condition called amniotic band syndrome. And that means when he was in his mother's his mother's developmental chamber, fibrous strands from her amniotic sac got wrapped around portions of his, uh, parts of his appendages. So while he was developing, the bottom of his right leg had a fibrous strand wrapped around it and it basically cut it off while he was still developing. He has a lifetime of battles to overcome and I want to be there present for him through them all but the issue is you know he has to get surgeries in order to Revised the stump. And every time he had to get any sort of treatment whatsoever, and he's also deep on the autism spectrum, so anytime he has to get any sort of treatment whatsoever, I feel his pain like I've never felt anything before. When he cries, it literally cuts my soul. The bond between us is insane. And the only thing I think that could hurt me more than hearing his cries and being powerless to do anything about, about his pain would be not hearing him cry at all. So when I think about how she must be feeling right now, I don't I don't know if I could breathe. I don't know if I could breathe if I was her. And all I feel is just love and A desire to, for her to find some peace. I don't know how long it'll take. I have a friend who, whose grandmother lost two children, and she she didn't recover psychologically from it. None of this shit is fair. None of this shit is fair.
Hey, Ash, bro, what's up, man? You know, society, um, society is a bitch, man. We don't get a chance to do anything but live hand to mouth and try and stay ahead of this huge vacuum sucking up everything behind us. We don't get a chance to settle into our to to the better side of our human nature. We're not given enough to think about anything other than what's immediately in front of us. It's kind of like the walking dead. That was that's what came to mind when I saw that our son had passed today. It was like the walking dead. And here you lose this character that everybody loved or you see someone who is closely linked to a character that everyone loves get ripped away from them and that, that, that feeling of powerlessness. It does something to you. It cracks you inside. And in the midst of everything that's happening in the world right now, we are under attack. We are under attack. We're under financial attack. We're under socioeconomic attack. We're under, we're under attack from parasitic force trying to have its way with the population so that it can ultimately live and benefit at the expense of the species and is using a cultivated strand of human that's so vile and so corrupt that it's, it's consciousless. It will do anything to benefit itself and destroy anything And we, we have to deal with all of that rage, all of that just disgustingness over here, waiting for reality to handle it over there. It's not fair. Right now, I just want to drop everything and go to this woman and just I don't know what to do I don't there's no hug tight enough there's no there's there are no words pretty enough there's no escape good enough to just make that to make that that even tolerable on any level The only thing I could think of worse than seeing my little boy cry and feeling powerless to help him is if he couldn't cry at all. You know, it's really interesting because it kind of gets into the disgustingness of society of parasitism, of corruption in general. One of the most unfortunate things we learn as humans is to blame things or to find some reason. We have to find something to blame in order to make sense of things. It's why people look for individuals to blame and punish instead of focusing on problems to solve. We get taught that that is that is solving the problem. Finding someone to blame and take our anger and frustrations out on. The socialization process gives us zero options for finding ways 
to process complex emotions and suffering, pain and loss. Much in the same way in school, you don't learn how to earn money. You don't learn how to do taxes. You don't learn any, you don't learn any useful life skills. You don't learn any useful life skills when it comes to learning how to process complex emotions. You don't get into psychology and sociology and what's been studied all the way until you get into college and you have to pay to get a cheap, a cheap sort of like overview of how it works at a mechanical level. The reason I mention this is because society gives you all the wrong tools. The tools are not meant to help you learn how to get ahead in life. They're tools that are meant to keep you broken and subjugated and heavily reliant on the system and escapes to distract you from the system so that you can just find the strength to press forward long enough to produce for society before it throws you away. You're not taught how to grieve. You're not even taught how to, how to love. You're not taught anything. You're taught, basically, if something isn't exciting to you, turn away from it, throw it away. If something doesn't serve you, throw it away. And if something hurts you, get mad and hit it. Or find something to hit. So when people go through losses like my friend did today. They have no tools. No Emotional tools, no paradigms, no nothing for them to fall back on. They can look to religion and the placebo of belief. They can look to psychologists who just, or, or, or therapists who basically just give them a space that allows them to be honest with themselves, but they're not given, and that's conditionally honest, but they're not given real tools to solve problems with. Imagine someone telling you, you're supposed to build a house, right? And then giving you fucking Play-Doh and like a child's plastic tool set. That's what society does to humans. It says, hey, you go figure out life in this circumstance I created. And you better get it right. And I'm going to give you fake tools to do it with. It's a disgusting, disgusting thing. Uh, sounds like your friend, like many of us, are suffering a lot. Looking forward to hearing what you have to help on the subject of inner tor torments. I think it could help many people. Everyone has great potential. We are all many things. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit. But... Having to focus through all this. You know what's really most interesting about um, even recounting 
what I went through with my own child and it being sort of brought up in the context of trying to wrap my hand around what this experience a friend is going through must be like so as to empathize with her properly. None of it's fair. Even with everything going on with my kid, like even in my circumstance, I never got a chance to stop being this thing. I never got a chance to stop doing this thing. Even when he was in the hospital, even when he was in the hospital, he was in NICU for four, the first four months of his life. He was in NICU. Every day they had him on a, I mean, his heart was rate was going down. He was barely, he's barely making it. Little champion he is. But this whole ordeal, this avatar thing, it never let up. I had to keep being this through one of the most emotionally taxing periods of my life. And just like, just like my circumstance didn't allow me to disengage from life and just sort of lick his wounds and lick my wounds and try and get everything established, everything just kept pressing forward. And I'm thinking about my friend. she's going to have to go to a home that was with her and her baby, her son, her older son. She's going to have to be there. There are no escapes. And she was a single mother. So he wasn't just her baby. He was her best, he was her best friend. And this, this disgusting thing that is society. That is still want her to figure out, through her grief, how to give it what it wants in the form of life force. By way of trying to capture rent and other bills and things from her. So that it can feed the fucking vacuum at the top. It is a disgusting entity. Regardless of how you look at it, the loss of both of her children, the loss of both of her children are a direct result of systemic, systemic aggressions carried out against targeted individuals and groups by disgusting, corrupt individuals beholden to corruption done out of pride, done out of a desire to have things to transfer their rage into. When I say that these people who are beholden to corruption are hated by reality, make no mistake about it. It's like even with the magnitude of everything that's gone down today, the emotional pain, physical pain, there is nothing the human experience has to offer that comes remotely close to matching what's coming to individuals who help to create the circumstance the socioeconomic circumstance that created, that resulted in not just the passing of these two lives, but all the imbalances, pain and suffering in the world, there's, there's nothing to compare it to. When I say they're hated by, like just to let corruption, to let Satan use you in such a way that you delight in creating circumstances that lead to pain and suffering from others 
Your heart is corrupt to the core. Your being is corrupt to the core. The entity I'm hosting, it hates corruption with a passion. Once it's free of this shell, But waiting on that to happen on the next side of existence or whatever. You can't think in terms of justice. You have to figure out how to focus and keep moving forward. Which again is unfair. You have to figure out figure out how to push through unimaginable pain and shock, and drama, and dismay, and how to focus. And, and you're never really given much of a chance to, are you? Somehow you're supposed to learn how to stop, to get out of the aggressor mode. Somehow you're supposed to figure out how to, how to, how to calm down long enough to listen, and stop fighting, and stop competing long enough to understand but you live in a world that requires you to compete all the time and requires you to sort of dial into your inner story and block out everything that says you don't deserve and that is how you survive in society which makes this an unfathom it's just such an unfair circumstance it's fucking ridiculous yet you're expected to figure it out it's no one's fault that they were born into this circumstance it's no one's fault that they had to endure the socialization process which trained them to think, live, and behave in this way. Yet somehow, through all of the craziness going on in the world, you're hit with this test. Reality is trying to determine whether or not you are coachable. Can you stop thinking at the level of self-interest long enough to sync up with it? And if you can, then it's like, oh, I'm going to give you all the assistance you need. And if you can't, reality is like, yo, I'm sorry, but I got to cut you away. You know what? Let me focus, though. Let's talk about ways to learn how to manage loss. Let's talk about ways to learn how to manage stress and hardship, heartache in the, uh, the unimaginable. The reason why I speak so much about principles and the principle realm and all these other things, and why I give you all these frames process and information and reality is because ultimately we're all going to be out of these bodies soon enough anyway it sucks when we exit these forms well before our time and when our potential to impact the world gets cut short but there isn't a single one of us that's making it out of here alive. And this is just an opportunity to figure out how to, at least on the material side of existence, balance your spirit so that you are a functional agent of reality, right? I spend a lot of time talking about reasoning and honesty. And a lot of people think that it's, it's sort of dismissible at this point. It's, it just sounds kind of like a talking point, but it's, it's not. The more you practice reasoning and honesty is the more you sort of develop and enhance your spirit. You develop your sense of bravery. And it's, it's literally like working out for the soul. So think about practicing reasoning and honesty like 
I wouldn't even say liking it to go into a gym and exercise it. Think about reason and honesty is like doing some purposeful thing that's labor intensive that ultimately strengthens your body through work, through accomplishing things. Imagine being a carpenter or a lumberjack or and your body's strong and you're built durable because you do real work. That's what reasoning and honesty is like. But the more you practice reasoning and honesty is the more you strengthen the core of what you are in a non-material fashion. The stronger you are is the more resilient you are. So even if you enter into a circumstance in which you are damaged in an unimaginable way, your sort of spiritual building blocks are pliable and they're healthy. And that means that they can reform and restructure in a shorter period of time. So if you experience a great heartache, the more practiced in reasoning and honesty you are, it doesn't mean that you're not going to hurt, but your recovery time is going to be a lot quicker than if you spend a lot of time, you know, processing information and reality through idealism. The more you practice being in sync with what's actually happening in the world around you is the more you 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 become resilient and, and capable of bouncing back whenever you experience any type of heartache, whether it be romantic or you know, um in the form of my friend in the form of loss or pain or suffering. When you get lost off in idealism, oh man that 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 the the losses the lo the pain and suffering when you're processing information and reality through idealism pain and suffering it it'll drag you down into depression and it will destroy you it will annihilate you when you practice reason and honesty you're necessarily sort of bypassing idealism Again, reasoning is using the mental faculties to suss out what's consistent with and actual within reality. And um, honesty is the individual's will and effort to recognize and sync up with reality. Truth and idealism are mutually exclusive things. Truth is what's consistent with and actual within reality. So when you're focusing on things that are real, tangible, and that can be measured independent of your independent measured independent of your individual experience within reality then you are focused on what is there what is real what is tangible and when you get off into idealism idealism is what is possible and it it it's it's more like reality is what is and idealism is what if and if you let what if drag you down into that abyss, it will beat the ever loving shit out of you over and over and over again. That is why it's imperative to learn how to practice reason and honesty. I actually put up a link to my um, latest medium article, which gives a more like a more mechanical breakdown of what I'm describing to you right now. But yeah, this isn't this isn't like a sort of scenario that belief can carry her through. No, this is a thing that only reality like only reality has the power to to to, to sort of rectify and heal. It's idealism will only make it worse. And anyone who's going to her with belief and telling her, like trying to get her to use belief to shield herself from pain is only going to do damage to her. Which is why I wish 
it was within my power to get to her like right now. And even in that, it's not like I'd have anything she's actually trying to hear in the moment. But at least I'd want to keep her away from things that encourage her to go into, go down the escape path. Because that, that'll only make things worse as she moves forward. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, finish this up right here. Uh, let me see. We are only we only see parts of our potential that are expressed and judge and reduce ourselves to limited definitions based on those. But that shouldn't sum us up. We are complex. We aren't reductionable. These are false constructs of ourselves that limit and confine us into a box or a prison of our own creating we should each we should add each of these things to ourselves the good and bad and use the adding up of these th these to create glasses that can show us what talent what latent what is latent in us that is there is so much more to us so much we don't know about ourselves and when we begin to see this in ourselves we can see it in others too even if others don't see it in themselves and we can encourage and support and nurture their potential out of them so they can see it to despite what they think of themselves and the past reductionist singular units they have believed themselves to be in the past okay um yeah um Okay, uh, I I want to I'll, I'll figure out how to connect that to the um, topic of discussion, hopefully soon. Brother Absurd comes in. Um, the way you describe spiritual recovery sounds like how a physical body recovers from injury. That's exactly what it is, Brother Absurd. That's exactly what it is. Um, it, it, in again, principle. And and material, they follow the same, they follow the same core set of ironically principles, right? Which is what m makes the things that an avatar says sort of universal. They apply to both the material and the principal realm. So what you see over here is what how it applies over there, and vice versa. So um, just kind of like doing things to keep your physical body healthy and fluid and in the flow of life um, makes it so that you live without disease disease the same principle applies to 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 reasoning and honesty the same principle applies to reasoning and honesty when you are doing things to to mind your for lack of a better expression your spiritual health you know what I'm saying? And making sure that you're taking information in and information is flowing out of you cleanly through the reasoning process and through honesty and things of that nature is very much like drinking clean fluid and then waste material passing from your body. Or you exercising and your body um, pumping uh, blood through your circulatory, circulatory system and then through your kidneys and collecting, um, passing new nutrients to areas that need it and then filtering out old nutrients, or not old nutrients, but toxins as it goes. This is what reasoning and honesty does at, at, at a principle level. It's, it's the same principle. It's the same principle. Basically, you're supposed to be a conduit. You take things in, transform them, and they move away from you. This is how it works in reality with you as a cognizant being. You take expressions, you take things in, you become an agent of transformation, and then through expression, you go on to impact the greater system you operate within. So everything is about basically taking in and releasing. And when you're dealing with sort of beliefs, beliefs, they're kind of like preservatives and like fast foods and junks and toxins that build up in your system. Beliefs are literally like toxins that build up in your system. They build up in your mind and they build up in your spirit. And before you know it, 
They cause you all sorts of. Uh, they cause your they cause your your spiritual body to break down. So, um, yeah, they cause your spiritual body to break down, and you know it's it's, it's kind of like when I went to go and check out Doctor Sebi, his he was the he was the plunger. Yeah, what you know, he was the plumber, is what he referred to as. A, and all he does is just help people figure out how to clear their systems so that things can pass through them properly and not get trapped inside of them. And, um, yeah, it's hopefully I'm not butchering this right now. I'm, I'm mad distracted. Um, yeah, so it's wild, man. You have to, um, Somehow we had to figure out how to stay focused through all this shit, man. And not only focus through it, but learn new stuff and apply new stuff. And learn how to be brave and learn how to be honest and learn how to deprogram ourselves from the socialization process and not live and think like fucking parasites. To not be fucking narcissistic. To not show up making everything about us. Even though that's what we're literally trained to do, we have to figure out how to bypass that. We have to figure out how not to compete for attention. We have to figure out how to not be aggressive assholes. All in the process of dealing with all of this loss and tragedy that just gets dumped on us every day. I'm going to see um, if in the group that was tagged in, they came up with her cash app or whatever. And I'll try and post it to my page so that, you know, people can donate. It's wild. It's wild. No, let me see. Uh, absolutism. Uh. Uh, okay. I had a heartbreak yesterday. I thought I had composed myself the day before. Knowing that nothing thought is or was ever forever, was ever forever in reality. But yesterday I started thinking of the broken dream that I had trusted and believed might come true. And how it's sudden disappearance and mounting and amounting to nothing. And it hit me like a brick. Ghosts tore open, tore and opened my heart. Um, but it didn't hurt as much as it has in the past. It could have been much worse, but I suspended that type of thought. And over some hours, the heartbreak dissipated for the most part. I still feel a tiny bit now, but it's negligible. Absolutism, belief, promises, eternal and lasting things the reward of forever in knowledge but really it seems to cause blockages because it's static in a ever-changing universe of flow okay yeah um yeah uh huh. yeah it's finding you know, loss, again, going back to the point, loss, when you try to deal with loss, when you try to manage loss from within idealism, um, it, 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 it's, it's like a snowball effect. It, it'll drag you down and beat you down inside of idealism. Loss, and there's probably a better way to say that. I'm, I'm a little stumbled over my words right now. Um, but... Deal, you can either deal with things in reality or you can deal with them in idealism, but you can't do both. You can deal with things in reality or in idealism, but never both. And if you're trying to use ideas, and so ideas and that entails meanings, feelings, beliefs, symbolisms, um, uh, stories, etc., to try and make sense of reality it's it's going to take you deeper and deeper 
into the abyss, it's going to divorce you further and further from reality the more and more you start sort of dissecting and trying to make sense of all of these effects that only exist inside the imagination. When you start dealing with and addressing things in reality and getting away from this system of idealism, then all of a sudden you start you start being able to make better sense of things because you can view them as objects, not as these nebulous effects that only um, that only have value and form when they are felt, not necessarily when they are scrutinized or analyzed. So the point is very simply, um, when you're facing grief, when you're dealing with grief, grief, you, you, you have to get away from idealism, as far away from idealism as you possibly can. There's no room for philosophies, no room for opinions, no room for things. You need to be able to deal with things as static objects, as objects that you can use to, I guess, sort of base situational awareness for reality at large on. And that is the, uh, that's the main thing. That's the main thing, like, there's no room for, like, in reality, Human emotions, you, the only, in reality, the only things that you are going to experience are fear, love, and fear. And those are going to be the main things that you experience. And you will feel, you will feel lost to some degree, especially if a bond, if bond is severed prematurely, as is the case with my friend who lost her son, the bond was severed prematurely. So it's just like if there's like a, so let's say the skin on my arm, all of these cellular building blocks are bound together. If something comes along and cuts them, I'm going to experience pain. Why? Because even though these cellular building blocks were ultimately going to break down as I continue to age and then ultimately when I pass on for this form, when the bond is severed prematurely, it results in pain, right? So, you know, if you have an emotional bond with anyone and it's severed prematurely, it sucks it hurts like a motherfucker okay right but you know when you understand that um in in such a situation what's going to promote healing is for their first to be distance and separation you know there's going to be within this cut there would be fear and as everything found, found its way back into place everything was spaced back out because even through the cut a lot of the cellular building blocks, not only would they be forcibly separated from each other, but then it would also cause the ones on the, 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 uh, the outside of the cut, the cellular building blocks on the outside of the cut, to collapse into each other. So there would be a compression on the outsides of the wound, and then there would be a forced space on the inside of wound, and ultimately it's imbalance. And in order for there to be, for the cellular building blocks to find their way back into a state of balance and cohesion, first there would have to be a fear. There would have to be distance and separation between the compressed building blocks on the outside of the cut, and then ultimately they would come back together and they would bond together. All right? And, um, you know, the reason why I mention that is because, again, in reality, everything is mechanical. So when you start trying to deal with, I guess, processing um, emotions in through through idealism, then everything becomes sort of nebulous and it's not mechanical. It's it's more subjective. And you have to forgive me because I'm reading these principles in real time and it may not come out as cleanly as I'd like for it to. But the thing is. When you are dealing with loss, when you're dealing with tragedy and pain and idealism, because there there is no real structure to the perception of acquisition and loss because they don't these do not have mechanical roles in reality. You understand what I'm saying? Um, this the pain is only ample, the pain that you experience from having a premature sever between a prematurely severed bond, the pain that you experience in idealism is significantly amplified as compared to what you would experience in reality. So let's say like a mother tiger loses her child. She will mourn for, she'll mourn for like a week or two. She'll mourn, 
and she'll get back on the living. Here, if you lose your kid and with idealism, it's a possibility you never get over that. So, okay, let me see. What's the difference between loss and disempowerment and idealism? All right, well, in, um, well, in idealism, loss and disempowerment are one and the same. Um, and let's say, and I would say the only difference is, uh, well, no, they're, they're pretty much one and the same. That's a great question. Good use of connective reasoning there. Um, most people, they're afraid of loss because they unconsciously equate loss to disempowerment. Right? So um, most people, and that's the reason why, you know, phobia, uh, uh, trauma is an extreme phobia of disempowerment and or an extreme phobia of loss. The loss of ability, the loss of influence, the loss of status, the loss of relationships, etc. But that's a great question. That is a great question. Uh, let me see. Brother Ashbrook comes in. Thought can lead us into a rabbit hole. Then we try to think our way out of the rabbit hole we think we are in, but it doesn't work. Um, we stop thinking. We realize we are already outside of it. The rabbit hole is gone. We look around and we are here in reality. We aren't in thought or the situation, but our engagement in it made it seem so. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's ultimately what it um, comes down to, you know, when I, I like to call idealism the phantom realm. And in the phantom realm, anything is possible. Anything is possible. In reality, the only things that are possible are things that 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 work within the limits of natural organization. You know what I'm saying? So. But yeah, when you, when you start getting into ideas, and you bring you bring you bring loss or you bring terror into ideas, look look. Okay, so for example, pay attention to people who get fear mongered into hating minorities or hating foreigners or hating uh, poor people or any of these other things. They have. Pardon me. Now, in reality, and I'll use the United States as an example. In reality, you have a lot of people who have been trended into thinking that enemy number one is African Americans. A lot of white people who get trended into thinking enemy number one is black Americans. Now, in reality, black Americans only make up 12% of the population here, have the fewest resources of any group, have the fewest resources of any group here in the United States, are constantly being harassed and beat down by the system, yet they are considered enemy number one by racists from different groups. They're considered enemy number one by racists from different groups. Now, in reality, they are not a threat at all. In idealism, they're out to get your wives and rape your children and steal and uh, hold you up with guns and never all of them have a gun. In, in idealism, black men, black people in the United States are the boogeymen. They are the boogeymen. In reality, not so much. Think about it like this. People go swimming in the ocean and they have these, these huge fears of sharks. Oh my God. Elephants kill. Elephants kill way more i think sharks kill like maybe six people a year elephants kill about 500 people a year but nobody fears elephants but in idealism sharks are the great scary creatures of the ocean in idealism everything is worse everything is scarier and more dangerous everything hurts worse Which is why if you love people, if you really love them, not, not for no other reason than to stop them from suffering, you do everything in your power to get them out of idealism. 
You do everything in your power to get them out of the system of belief and to stop trying to assign meanings to things. We all experience loss in reality. The reason why the Buddha teaches no attachment is because when you form an idealistic bond with something and it gets taken away from you, it, it throws you into a state of depression. You live without attachments, so you're not constantly triggered and living in a state of perpetual cognitive dissonance and emotional teetering. But yeah, it's a lot. Uh, uh, Brother Ashwell comes in, what creates the bond in idealism? I imagine it's perception that the idea or ideal has taken some relation or relevance to us or something like that. That is part of reality until it's not and then it gets cut. Um, well, in idealism, and I, I wrote a piece on this that I shared a link to on my page. Um, but when you're talking about an idealism, idealism doesn't really view in terms of bonding. It views in terms of acquisition. So in idealism, things become objects. And when you form an attachment to an object... A lot of times humans mistake that as a bond and they view the object as an extension of their identity. Humans are afraid of losing identity features more than they are of, they don't know what it's like. Most, most humans have no idea of what it's like to actually form a real bonds, period. So the only thing, they never see anyone as anything more than an extension of their identity. This is my wife. This is my son. This is my daughter. This is my, 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 my. And when they lose these effects, when they lose these objects, then all of a sudden, it's like, you know, they, 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 they question for their own survival. They're like, oh man, how am I going to make it without this tool I was using as a coping mechanism? How am I going to make it without this object? And um, in reality, a bond is a real bond. Now, the bond can wear off. The bond can be prematurely severed. But a bond is a bond. And, um, you know, it's very different than an idealism because when you have a bond with someone, they're not an extension of your identity. They become sort of an extension of your true self, which is like what most parent-child relationships healthy parent-child relationships are like, you know, people are like, oh my God, um, this person is an extension of me. They're a true extension of me. Their growth is my growth. Their pain is my pain. Their, their hardship is my hardship. Their accomplishment is my accomplishment. Their happiness is their ha my happiness, right? When you view someone as an object, however, the, you only care about them to you only care about their well-being to the extent that you are not inconvenienced by them. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is what this is how narcissism works. So, narcissism again. Narcissists make everything about themselves. Me, 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 me. Someone who is you know considerably a person who they love. Their thoughts are, how does this person reflect me to other people? How does this person make me look in terms of importance? How does this person, how, does they, how do they benefit me? How do they benefit me, 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 me? Right? And um, when you have an authentic bond with someone in reality, you, you, don't, you don't see yourself first. You care for them because caring for them is caring for you. Um, let me see. Uh, uh, the only in the only enemy is the enemy we create in our own mind. The author of the enemy is subjectivity. We create the idea of an enemy. Then the author is the belief that the idea represents a real thing. I have no enemies because 
I don't make them in my mind because I know it's my own mind and I choose what goes in it and what I give credence to as real in it. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. I, I'm having a bit of trouble sort of connecting that to what this podcast is about, but um, I guess the the goal is to ultimately figure out how to heal in reality as opposed to escape deeper into idealism. And I think that that applies sort of unilaterally across the board. Um, I'm gonna, we're getting towards the end of the hour here, so I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping this up. Guys, you already know what this is. Um, this is Sorting and Sorting Principles with Donald King. Um, the goal of this podcast is to help people learn how to um, make sense of reality using principles. Um, I am Avatar Cycle 13. I host a function of reality that is a living sentient entity. And that entity, that life form, it allowed that non-material life form, it allows me to see reality in and according to principles. Principles are mechanical. They're scaffolds that serve to create and 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 sort of um and and sort of orchestrate systems of natural organization. So in this podcast series, I'm describing principles of natural organization and then principles of also um, viral parasitic organization, which society is necessarily a branch of. So yeah, um, the goal is to help people figure out how it all works mechanically and to encourage people to use connective reasoning so that they can start to see how these things work for themselves. Right. Um, you know, uh, I shoot these podcasts on Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, you can actually also on Facebook Live and you can also check me out on uh, Instagram. Uh, I am Avatar Cycle X. I, 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 it's Avatar Cycle 13. And also I am on I, I post these podcasts to YouTube so that you can go back and reference them on your own time and on your own terms. And, um, yeah, also I post content to Medium. I post my Medium posts in different groups and on my page as well. Again, the goal is to help people learn the mechanism of reality. That's the whole point of an avatar. If somebody sees the system mechanically, it's not my job to project my own feelings, beliefs, or symbols onto the system. My job is simply to describe what I see through the perspective that's been afforded to me, and hopefully you all are able to benefit from it. If you get any sort of appreciation out of what I do and you want to give your boy a little bit of love, you can always salt bay me um, at cash. You can always cash at me at Donnie Kang. That's D-O-N-N-I-E-K-A-N-G. Um, also, you can join the Patreon family. Uh, proceeds go to helping get things organized on this side. I've had some assistance within the last few years. Not much. A few people have stepped up and done done what they can to help out but it's like you know um this work it takes a lot i've done most of this solo for the last 13 plus years and um you know it's like i'm giving people an opportunity to pitch in if what i'm saying is as important as i claim it is and it is then it's only fair for me to give you all an opportunity to be part of hearing it yourselves so, um, yeah, that said, I'm going to, um, I'm going to go ahead and sign off here. Uh, what do we got here? I don't think of enemies. They don't exist to me. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and sign off here. Um, yeah. So guys, just to recap what we're talking about, um, Life in society is not fair. You're not given an opportunity to, to, to make sense of things. You are constantly fighting to stay ahead of this, this vacuum that's sucking up all the life behind you and trying to steal your potential from you every waking moment. In every waking moment, society is trying to benefit from you. It is a disgusting thing. 
And it created circumstances that robbed a nice lady of two of her babies. You weren't given tools to figure out how to manage your emotions. You weren't given tools how to learn how to... You weren't given tools for how to process, you know, um, life events and, and, and tragedy and trauma. Society just basically said, hey, make money and that's going to solve all your problems. And that, that's just not true. It's just not true. And, you know, um, when you're dealing with loss, when you're dealing with tragedy, the only thing that's going to actually help you heal, the only thing that's actually going to get you together is recognizing and syncing up with reality. If you go deeper into idealism, you're going to experience more heartache more suffering, more psychological damage and injury because in idealism, all of your pain is amplified, all of your loss is amplified. If you love somebody and they're hurting, your goal should be to get them to recognize and align with reality and get them to focus on reality instead of allowing them to go into the abyss of their thoughts because in there, idealism will destroy them. And that's guaranteed. It's your man. I'm out.